On this episode of Twill, Fedora has announced a new branch of their distro with immutable operating systems in mind called Fedora Atomic Desktops. System76 says we are getting very close to an alpha version of the Cosmic Desktop. I am super excited about that. Then we're going to be talking about the Linux kernel and kernel security, as well as Mozilla is refocusing on Firefox, the browser specifically, while also doing some weird stuff. We'll talk about that later in the show. Plus, we have some potentially good news related to AI and patents. All of this and so much more on this week's episode of This Week in Linux, your source for Linux. Good news. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Linbit. More on them later. The Fedora project has announced some atomic level news that's related to their atomic desktop. Yeah, that was bad, wasn't it? (laughs) Okay, so the Fedora Atomic desktops are a new family of Fedora Linux spins, and they aim to simplify discussion over the RPM-OS tree implementations or the immutable OS versions of Fedora Linux. Now, this is really good because simplifying this is very, very needed because RPM-OS tree, well, it doesn't just roll off the tongue, of course, and Atomic Desktop It doesn't really explain exactly what it is, but it does improve it overall as far as how to talk about it. And it also relates to a project that previously existed, the Project Atomic thing from Fedora Linux, which they started about 10 years ago with Atomic Host. And they also made Fedora Atomic Workstation, which was then renamed into Silverblue. Now, this is really cool because there are many reasons of why this is a necessary thing. But mostly it's because they are adding more spins to this family. At least that's the intention. So they're, or the anticipation anyway. So they want to make sure that the next time when people add new branches, it's going to make sense. For now, we have Fedora Onyx, which doesn't really convey anything to do with Budgie, right? The Budgie desktop. Or Sericea, which is the Sway version of the Fedora Atomic system. So Fedora Sway Atomic much better than that, and Fedora Budgie Atomic, much better than that. So the reasons for new branding is that they anticipate more spins, but also it's just making it easier to discuss these things because a lot of people think that Silver Blue is a completely different version of the Fedora system rather than, and sometimes people think it's a different distro altogether because people usually talk about it as Silver Blue rather than Fedora Silver Blue and that sort of thing. So it does make sense that they're going to be doing this. Now, it is worth noting that the Fedora Silverblue and Fedora Kinoite are not going to be changing their name because they just have a uh, longer reputation and people are already aware of those names. So it makes sense to keep them. Whereas the other ones don't really have any established understanding of those terms. So switching those off makes sense, as well as getting ready for the future way of doing the Fedora, then DE name, then Atomic for the format. Uh, So that makes a lot of sense. And it also simplifies identification and differentiation of the desktop environments much, much easier. So overall, I think this is good for them to do. And I look forward to seeing what the new Atomic desktops are, as well as trying out the ones that already exist, because I didn't even know there was a Sway version. So I'd like to check it out. If you'd like to learn more about this particular news, you'll find links in the show notes. Mozilla has announced they're going to be refocusing on the Firefox web browser as well as some other stuff, such as new CEO transition happening and layoffs because reasons. The new CEO is going to be Laura Chambers, who's already a board member for Mozilla and is stepping into the CEO role. And Laura Chambers does have an impressive background, such as leading product organizations at prominent tech companies like Airbnb, PayPal, and eBay. So this does seem like a potential good thing for Mozilla, but at the same time, they said it's going to happen for the remainder of the year. So I don't know how long a new CEO can be effective and have much impact if they don't even have a year of time being the CEO. So hopefully it's a lot and hopefully it's good. The impact, I mean, we'll see. And if you'd like to know what the key goals for the new CEO, Laura Chambers, is going to be, then you can check out the links in the show notes. I'm not going to go into it because it's basically like you know, buzzwords and corporate speak and that sort of thing. So you can check it out if you want to. But let's move on to, well, the other news that we have, the layoffs. 
Mozilla has said that they're scaling back development on some projects, which is resulting in layoffs. 60 employees are affected, which is about 5% of the workforce of Mozilla. And they're doing cutbacks on a lot of stuff, including the online footprint scrubber that was announced recently. The thing I'm pretty sure that's referring to the Mozilla Monitor Plus that we just talked about. So that's weird. Also, they're scaling back some stuff for the privacy products like Mozilla VPN, Mozilla Relay, and some other stuff. So some of these services kind of make sense that they're going to do stuff like to pull them back a little bit or scale them back a little bit because they're not that effective. And some of the reasons are clear, like they're obvious why they're not effective. The Mozilla VPN is overpriced and it doesn't offer that much value. For example, it's based on Molvad. Molvad is the core underlying thing of Mozilla VPN and it is cheaper than Mozilla VPN and it supports more devices than Mozilla VPN. So yeah, why would anybody choose Mozilla VPN rather than just picking Molvad? That's weird. So I get why that was not a, an effective way of making a service. But there, the, the relay system is pretty cool for email relay for uh, being having privacy in that sense. Uh, and also the other stuff they have is pretty cool. And I don't want them to get rid of these things. I want them to make more of these services and make a whole co like collective suite. I want them to compete with Google's G Suite and have Mozilla M Suite. I don't know what to call it, but something like that, where you have a calendar, you have the email, you have the, all the stuff, and you even have Thunderbird attached to it. You can get, connect all of these things together and you'd have a cool suite. But that's not what we have. Instead, we have an overpriced VPN, which is surprising that it didn't work out. Wow. They're also going to be changing some stuff related to the Mozilla.social Mastodon instance. They're saying that they're reducing the investment in it, transitioning to a strategic correction, whatever that means, with a smaller team. They do want to note that it is not being shut down, but it is reducing investment. So I think you should probably get off of this instance. That's just my opinion, because whatever strategic correction means, it doesn't seem like it's too far away from actually getting rid of the instance. So maybe just go check out mastodon.social, mastodon.online, or whatever other you know generic universal options there are. Or maybe if you want to have a specific one, there's a lot of those too. Now, they're going to be prioritizing Firefox web browser on both the desktop and the mobile devices, which is really cool. I'm really happy to be, see that. And also Firefox remains a main revenue source for Mozilla. So that does make sense. And I think Firefox is the best browser. It's, it's absolutely the best browser for me without a question. So I don't really see this as a negative there and them refocusing on Firefox. But I do see the negative of a new CEO being announced and all of a sudden layoffs. That's not good news. I don't like just... <laughs> Now, Firefox is still a competitive browser. It's not as big as Chrome, but it's still competitive. And I really love the privacy-focused aspects of it. And they're also now talking to plan to integrate uh, the AI stuff into Firefox. And that's really interesting because if Firefox is going to do that, you know that the AI they're going to implement is a trustworthy thing. And that's what I'm most excited about, of having AI benefits, but also not having to worry about everything that is being put through the AI to be sent off into the ether and but at the same time there's it's like mixed feelings about having a new ceo that is only intended for the remainder of the year already having layoffs and it hasn't even been two weeks since the announcement of the ceo now again i still consider firefox to be the best browser especially for me and i think that multi-account containers feature is one of the best reasons to use firefox it is a fantastic add-on but also, why is it still an add-on? It's, it's so good. Why do you make people use Firefox, never know it exists, and then abandon Firefox because you didn't put it in? Put it in. It's, it's, it should be simple. It's awesome. Put it in so people know that it's there and that it's awesome. You're not making it easy to like this new version of what's going on because this the timing of this is not great. But... Hopefully this will be helpful to Firefox, hopefully helpful to Mozilla, and I hope the people who are in part of this layoff find some uh, good jobs. And uh, Mozilla, man, get it together. That's, I, guess it's, I guess that's what I, you want to learn more about this, links in the show notes.
We are getting so close to the Cosmic Alpha. I am super excited. For those who don't know, this is System76 desktop that they're being they're developing, which is called Cosmic. And we have some progress update related to this, such as the screenshot functionality has been completed. They have also completed the implementation of floating Windows stacks, improved performance in the Cosmic Terminal. They now have uh, on-screen displays or OSDs finalized. They have animations for maximizing windows have been added. Display and wallpaper settings are completed and many more. And including they're, they're also working on some other stuff that's ongoing, such as hybrid graphic support being finalized, additional features for Cosmic Terminal and Cosmic Edit, tiling improvements in progress, workspace enhancements are underway already, and login screen support being developed. Now, there's this is still far away in the sense of having like a full-blown production-ready desktop, but I can't wait for the alpha. Uh, we've They basically announced this a couple years ago. We had Emma Marshall from System76 on the Destination Linux podcast to talk about Cosmic. I think it's very exciting that we're going to get to this point soon that the alpha is, a, is a, going to be something that we can try out and play with. Even though it's still alpha, I'm happy to see that they're saying that it's close to achieving that milestone. Now, they haven't said exactly when it's being released, but they do have a, pl a plan to be based on the version of Pop! OS that is powered by the Ubuntu 2404 LTS. So that's going to be a pretty soon, roughly, uh, hopefully, I guess, is really what I should say, because we don't know exactly, but hopefully. And I am personally excited, so... If you'd like to learn more about this news and the Cosmic Desktop in general, you'll find links in the show notes. This episode of Twill is brought to you by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since 2010, and Linstore, industry-leading open source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open source community as well because they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features to their products. Linbit provides enterprise grade software that runs on a variety of platforms without vendor lock-in, which is really cool because no matter what your OS is and no matter what kind of hardware you want to use, including off the shelf hardware, you're good to go with DRBD and Linstore. And also with DRBD and Linstore, you can have high speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula, there's even DRBD proxy for long distance replication. Linbit provides really awesome services like DRBD, and DRBD is a really good way to make sure you have good data recovery and backups. And if you ever have like a cluster with multiple nodes and one of those nodes fa fails, you can have rest assurance that the backup nodes will have the data that you want. So if you're interested in checking out any of the software from Linbit, I highly recommend it. So go to linbit.com to check it out. That's L-I-N-B-I-T.com. So let's talk about security. And we're gonna be talking about CVEs and CNAs, specifically because Linux, glibc, and many others are working to become their own CNAs. So the CNA system is CVE numbering authorities. What is CVE? Well, that means common vulnerabilities and exposures. And the CVE system is kind of a mess these days, which has caused a lot of organizations to try to become their own CNAs. And essentially, it's for tracking security issues found in software and really any kind of software. And the reason for this is because, well, we all run software and no software is perfect. I mean, there will be some security issues and we'll need to track those and deal with them. So it makes sense for having something like this to, to do that. One reason a lot of projects become a CNA is to control the flow of CVEs with respect to their own products. Essentially, there are times where CVEs are submitted about a piece of software. The software developers are informed about it. And when they try to verify, they see that it's not, it's not as bad as the CVE is claiming. And sometimes it's not even a security bug. It's a bug, but not a security bug. That happens too. Yet, without being a CNA, they can't really do much about it other than can complain to a CNA. And this is a problem because when some of the CNAs don't have extensive testing on the CVEs submitted, there can be issues where they just take them at face value, and this resorts in a mess. And this is just one of the issues with the current system. So the Linux kernel project has decided to become their own CNA, or CVE numbering authority. And this is really good because it's addressing anything that relates to Linux vulnerabilities. Now, this is a trend, as I've mentioned, that open source projects are becoming their own CNAs. 
such as Curl is doing that as well and others. So it, it makes sense because of the whole mess I described. But I think this is overall good because it means that CVEs that are classified or flagged as super high priority stuff that are not actually won't be going through anymore. And the news and media that's going around saying, oh, this is CVE means that it's broken and terrible and blah, blah, blah. And all of that is no longer going to be an issue, at least for this particular project, still could be an issue for others. So I think this is really good. And if you'd like to learn more about this information, uh, let me know in the comments below because I was thinking about maybe making a video about this whole topic and going into much more depth about what the CVEs are, why this current system is a mess and why this is good as well as why other projects should do this and that kind of thing. If you would like to know more about that and would like for me to make a video on it, let me know in the comments. And if you'd like to learn more about this news, you'll find links in the show notes. Only Office has released a new version with Only Office 8. And there's a lot of stuff to talk about. We're not gonna be able to talk about everything, but here are some highlights. First of all, they have support for right to left or RTL being added. Now this is an opt-in beta feature. So there are some known limitations, but this is gonna be very good for a lot of people who need to have RTL stuff for their language. This enables RTL text in the UI and bi-directional text input, which is very cool. They've also made some PDF improvements so for example, encryption for regular PDF passwords or PDFs with passwords has been done, which is very cool. A creation of fillable PDF forms from editable docxf templates have been added and many more. Also, they've made some improvements to the presentation app, this uh, spreadsheet editor apps, the, and they've also made a lot of cool stuff and for accessibility, which is very good, as well as the window control buttons for Linux now appear more like Linux styling rather than looking like a Windows application, which is very nice. So I like to see that. They've also done a lot of branding updates throughout the editor apps, as well as a lot of security fixes. And if you'd like to learn more about only Office or try it for yourself, you can get access to multiple different ways. You have uh, options for a dev package if you want, or you can also get an app image, snap, and a flat pack. And if you'd like to learn more about the latest release of only Office 8, you'll find links in the show notes. LibreOffice is in the news this week because they have a new version out that is 24.2. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. We're going to only be able to cover the highlights. But the biggest thing is that the version previously was called LibreOffice 7.6. And now we're at 24.2. So as you can tell, the numbering system has been modified quite a bit. Now they're using a calendar-based numbering system, which I think is good because it makes it much more clear about when something was made. Now, it's not necessarily good for all projects, but in this case, I do think it is good because they do it on a predictable cadence. So it says that the 24.2 is based on the year 2024 and the month of February. So I think that's good. It also allows users to easily see which one is the newest version and that sort of stuff. So overall, I think this is a good way to do it. And for some projects, they maybe even want to consider adopting that. And maybe not always, though. So this new version of LibreOffice 24.2 is based on six months of development with over 5,000 commits, which includes bug fixes, security enhancements, UI tweaks, UI tweaks new, new features, and interoperability improvements, which is really cool. Now, one of the new features I wanted to talk about is the auto recovery enabled by default. This is a very, very important thing. Auto recovery already having there is good but being enabled by default is very good because this makes it a lot easier for really everyone to use it. So I like that. Also, they have some improvements and enhancements to the notebook bar layout, as well as dark mode for KDE Plasma users, which thank you for that. And they've also made some updates to the writer app, impress and draw apps. Calc, Calc has got some additions as well as many other things like accessibility improvements, which is always good to see, and also some Microsoft Office compatibility fixes and many more. If you'd like to learn more about the latest news for LibreOffice, you can find links in the show notes. And if you'd like to try it out for yourself, you can get a snap or a flat pack. And there's some other options as well, but all those links will be in the show notes. UB Ports have announced that they are changing the release model for Ubuntu Touch mobile operating system. And this is good because not only are they changing the, the model itself, but they're also changing the ver versioning scheme so you know when something's coming out and that sort of thing. So this is very good. And they have they said that they're reducing, reducing friction in development process, and it's going to facilitate future long-term supported versions of Ubuntu Touch and ensure reliability and up-to-date mobile operating system for users. 
All of that sounds fantastic. Now, the reason for this is because there was a, a diverging code issue between Ubuntu 1604 and 2004 when they, ba- they made the transition and it caused some confusion. And because Ubuntu Touch currently has this system of Ubuntu Touch OTA4, for example, is the current one, that doesn't really express exactly what base it has or when it was made and that sort of thing. So they're making an adjustment there as well, which I think is fantastic to do because it was a little confusing first especially with the when it went from like i think ota 9 to ota 1 that was that was confusing so i'm glad that they're making this change this new release model is starting with ubuntu touch based on ubuntu 2004 and the release follows the format of year month and then minor changes so minor being like updates and stuff like that and usually bug fixes or security patches and that sort of thing so the first version of this would be, in theory, they're saying it's planned to be uh, 24.6.0, which would be the first version of that being released in June of this year. I like this. It makes it easier to know. It makes it easier to know when it's coming out. And it also makes it clear if, you're having, if you have the latest version or not. Because right now, it's just OTA4 and not as clear. <laughs> anyway... So I think in this case, just like LibreOffice, the simplification of the release model and the versioning scheme is going to benefit the Ubuntu Touch and the UB Ports project. So I'm happy to see that. If you'd like to learn more about this, you'll find links in the show notes. Lineage OS 21 has been released, bringing significant updates and improvements. For those unfamiliar, Lineage OS is a custom ROM that you can use to replace the version of Android that came with your phone by default. There's over 400 devices that are supported, and you can check the list to see if your device is supported. Now let's talk about some stuff that is new with Lineage OS 21. There's some security patches that have been merged across the Lineage line from 18.1 to 21. And they've also introduced a new app called Glimpse. No, it is not that fork of GIMP that you might be thinking of. It is a gallery app. And the name Glimpse makes much more sense for a gallery app. So good job on that. Also, significant improvements and redesigns in various applications have been seen, such as uh, Aperture, Calculator, can- Contacts, Dialer, Jelly, whatever that is, Latin IME, and the Messaging app, as well as more. There's also an introduction to a new boot animation, and they've uh, made updates to WebView, Seed Vault, and ETAR, as well as an enhanced updater app performance for AB testing, or AB updates, which is really nice. And there's also been a lot of improvements and enhancements for the developer side. So they've overhauled the merge scripts and extract utilities, as well as fully embraced LLVM and many more things. And if you'd like to learn more about the latest release of Lineage OS, you'll find links in the show notes. A new proposal has been sent into the Linux kernel project. And this is an interesting idea because it is a sandbox mode for the Linux kernel. And it's aimed at increasing the memory safety of C code within the kernel. Now, sandbox mode is described as an environment permitting memory access only to predefined addresses, intended to prevent exploitation of potential vulnerabilities or minimize their impact. The implement details are as follows, adds an API and ARC independent or Arch independent infrastructure to the kernel, executes target function on VMALLOC and a copy of input and output data, utilizes guard pages to prevent some out-of-bounds accesses and other things, and the primary goals are to reduce impact of memory safety bugs in kernel code, run each component inside an isolated execution environment, and isolate memory areas used as input and or output with guard pages. Now, this does all sound pretty cool, and especially the idea of having a safe mode usually sounds like a good thing, and I don't know for sure because I'm not a developer, especially not a kernel developer, so... Let me know in the comments below what you think about this news. And if you'd like to know more, you can find links in the show notes. I never thought that I would say U.S. Patent Office and software and then good job in the same sentence ever because they've not done that in the past. So so why would that change? But the U.S. Patent Office has said that AI models can't hold patents. So good job (laughs) because... They're saying that it needs to be an individual person and they're actually saying a natural person's making significant contributions to an invention can be named as inventors. Now that makes a lot of sense. So I'm happy to see that. 
Uh, but also the rationale behind this is saying that it's supported by statutes, court decisions, policy considerations, and also President Biden's executive order on AI. And as well as there was some uh, referencing for previous attempts by Dr. Stephen Thaler, Thalers, uh, trying to name AI programs as inventors, and that was rejected by U.S. courts. And it also aligns with the U.S. Copyright Office stance that AI models can't own copyright without substantial human input. So overall, I think there's a lot of improvements to, or a lot of good stuff around this because copyright, uh, patents, and all this sort of stuff, the AI models can't be the creators, the owners of that intellectual property. And I think that's good because, well, that would get very messy if it wasn't the case. Now, it's important to note that the use of AI for assistance doing something does not disqualify a human from holding a patent. It's, it just means that significant human contribution is required for patentability. They also say intellectual domination over AI alone doesn't confer inventorship. Significant contribution to invention conception is necessary. Also related to the application process, applications must name natural persons who significantly contributed as inventors, prohibits listing non-natural entities, even if AI was instrumental in creation, but it doesn't explicitly require that AI usage was, is disclosed during the application process, which could cause a little bit of issues here and there. But uh, overall, this is good news, in my opinion anyway. They're also seeking public comment, so if you'd like to send in some information about that, feel free to do so. And if you'd like to learn more about this news, you'll find links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in the Linux and open source world, then be sure to subscribe and of course, remember to like that smash button. If you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network, then consider becoming a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership where you can get a bunch of cool perks like access to patron-only sections of our Discord server and much, much more. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux Discover t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt at tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus, while you're there checking all the other cool stuff we have like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, and so much more at tuxdigital.com slash store. I'll see you next time for another episode of Your Source for Linux Good News. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell. I hope you're doing swell. Be sure to ring that notification bell. And until next time, I bid you farewell.